All right, in our last class, <clears throat> we were in Romans 8, and we had been dealing with um, pretty much verse 31 through 34 in light of what Jesus has done for us. And then we noticed a change in verse 35 through 39, and all of a sudden we were being included. All of a sudden, the expectation of God that the manifestation of the sons of God would begin to happen, not just the manifestation of saved people. And the groaning can only be dealt with by not saved people, but the manifestation of those who are conformed to the image of Christ. <clears throat> and so um, we were talking about uh, this thing about God who spared not his own son. How shall he not freely give us all things? And we were talking about the reaction to that. Well, that doesn't seem fair. Why would you make somebody who has been really good suffer and people who deserve to suffer because they've been really bad be blessed? And even while that's a concept in our minds, if that, and, and it may not be so offensive to us until we get into a situation where God wants to use you as a son and so he puts you in a situation to be accused and to be looked upon as evil and whatever. And you, what you do is you stand up and you justify yourself and you blame them and you point out, here's all their problems. Does that more, make more sense that when it's real life situation, it's not reality TV. It's real life, it's us. And it's what we, and God will do this to us and many times we miss the eternal moment. We do. I mean, we all do. I'm sure we all do. But we all don't want to. But we want the Spirit of God to, to really open this to us. I mean, we got a, we got a choice. We can either sit and listen to some idiot called me and, and, and try to grasp that, and maybe even the Spirit bear witness, or maybe he's not, and it's like, oh, what is this guy saying? Or we just say, Holy Spirit, if there's anything to this, help bring me into what the Father's heart is, if this really is a heart issue with the Father and with the Son. Yeah. Um, and so, so he says, so, the, so then it's talking about this, who spared not his own son, you know, but, but delivered those who didn't deserve it. And there's this reaction within us if we're in that situation but uh, God, even in the scripture here, beginning with verse 35, deals with that. And, and, um, or actually verse um, uh, 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Shall God that justifieth? Okay, so you could say with that, God, you're justifying evil people and, and Jesus is doing all the suffering. Or how about this? God, you're letting evil people off the hook and you're making me suffer. What's up with that? Okay. So he, he just says, God, is, is God going to join with you against those evil ones that are just now justified? Shall God that justify it? Uh, no, you, you're... You're playing a wrong hand here in this card game, okay? <laughs> Excuse my French. <clears throat> um, and then verse 34, who is he that condemneth? Shall Christ that died, is he, gonna, is he gonna complain about this? Is he gonna go, well, yeah, I shouldn't have died. And, you know, this just isn't fair in the way my father treats me, you know, or you know, the way God treats me. I've been nothing but good, and they deserve this. No. No, not only does he not condemn, who, shall, who is it that condemneth? Shall Christ that died, or yea, rather, that is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? And we see that continued um, ministry of Christ. The ministry of Christ on the cross? To die for others, to put others first. The ministry of Christ on the throne? Make an intercession. Come boldly to me with, you know, in a time of need and whatever. He should, you know, he rightfully shouldn't have to have all this junk still laid on him. <laughs> Come on. You're King of kings and Lord of lords, and he's still bowing down helping us with our little things. But this isn't about rightfully according to the carnal mind. 
this is who he is. Shall he condemn? No way. I'm, I'm interceding for these folks. So, um, so the last sentence I think I read to you in the last class, will he condemn us because we deserve nothing or will his response be that of acting on our part, standing up to intercede for us and protect us? The answer is he will honor the way of life out of, out of a selfless death by supporting us along with the Father's plan that called for his crucifixion. This, I, I support this. I'm of this. <laughs> You know, I choose the way of death. <clears throat> this is the way God is. After expounding how God approaches things by self-giving in trials and death, speaking of verse 31 through 34, this is how he approaches things. Um, he then turns to our part in the calling. You see, do you see your calling, brethren? Those who are called... And that's from Peter saying that one specifically. He then turns to our part in the calling. The next group of verses are directed toward those who have heretofore received magnanimous benefits from that selfless nature of God on, on our behalf. He gave himself on our behalf. And we have received blessings from that. But the emphasis now, the color has changed. The artist is not finished with his picture, but the emphasis is now upon God's expectation for us to enter into the calling and into the conformity. In other words, God now expects us to demonstrate that nature in our, our lives. All right, so Uh, let's read 35 through 39, Romans 8. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creation shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> All right, so we want to talk about becoming more than conquerors. More than. Much more. You remember the much more factor in Romans 5 and 6? Okay. More than. And so, and so begins the process what we just read, and so begins the process, the ancient path now handed over to us to be trod. God's heart pleased, God seeing the return, and they will come with singing unto Zion, an everlasting joy so be upon their heads. They're no longer afraid of death. They use death, and we'll get into that. So begins the process. Now, for others, we are killed all the day long, accounted as sheep to be slaughtered, lambs for the daily sacrifice. The fulfillment of the daily sacrifice. We are more than what a conqueror would be. Yes, we are conquerors in that we ultimately win, for a conqueror wins. But one who is more than a conqueror loses so others may win, just as Jesus did on the cross for us. Our goal is not to conquer suffering, conquer weakness, conquer death, but to utilize it. The defeat is turned to victory. Folks, so many Christians don't want to go into defeat. It's defeat that is turned into victory. See? Defeat turned to victory. Jesus was defeated. Jesus did not beat up the devil like some people act like he did. Jesus did not um, just, you know, um, just show great power. He went and died on a cross and he opened not his mouth and he looked 
every bit defeated as you can look. And yet, victory came out of defeat. The defeat has turned to victory just as it was with Jesus on the cross. We have conquered death and our fear of death. We have conquered death, not by destroying its existence, but by rendering it powerless to destroy us. Hebrews 2.11. Through death he destroyed him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. The actual, I assume it's Greek, even though it's in the book of Hebrews, the actual Greek there is destroyed is not annihilated, but it is rendered inoperative. It would be like, you know, this just came to my mind, but it'd be like if there was a train track that was there and there was this big old train with all of these, all of these cars, you know, and let's just say that all of the cars behind it, you know, several hundred cars, instead of being full of cattle, were full of demons, ready to be delivered at, at the next stop. And Jesus goes out there and he pulls one cog out of the engine that turns the wheels, that does the pull, all the other wheels, that brings up one little cog. Just like in a watch, you take one little cog out of it. Take the smallest one or the largest, doesn't matter. You render it inoperative. Uh, that's not, this is not my place to get into all this, but, but uh, what is it, Romans 6 really gets into that. We didn't take the time, we didn't treat this like the regular Romans class. But Romans 6 really shows this, this defeat of it by rendering it inoperative and what that means. And basically what the, the cog that needed to be pulled out was us, put us to death. <clears throat> rendered inoperative by killing Adam, killing our old nature. <clears throat> Sorry, what is that called when you tell them how the movie ends? Spoiler alert. <clears throat> um, now we can be killed all the day long and it only rebounds back to the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4.15 It is not just for the sake of those who give themselves in this way, but it is all of this is born for others who don't deserve it, for God and for others. So death has not been annihilated, but robbed of its power. Its power has to bring about fear, the, the, its power was to bring about fear of death, which caused many self-serving, self-saving actions, which were contrary to Christ. And this is who, uh, Hebrews 2, uh, 15. The uh, one about rendered the, through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death, Hebrews 2, 11. This is Hebrews 2.15 that, um, and I don't have it written down here, let's say, uh, fear, who through fear of death all their life long were held into bondage, okay? But the answer for defeating the enemy was through death. And the answer for us for defeating the enemy is through death. And we don't have, the, the, we don't have fear of death now. Death has become our tool, our friend. The cross is our friend. Can I get amen on that? <laughs> it's like, I don't know about this teaching. He's, he's so wrong. I am afraid of that. <clears throat> well, I mean, if you just, if you just take the, you know, I, I made the statement that so many through, um, through fear of death has caused many self-serving, self-saving actions which were contrary to Christ. If, if I could give you examples, it would blow your mind of what people will do to save themselves. Jesus said, if you seek to save yourself, you lose. But if you lose for my sake, for his sake, for the sake of his life, for the sake of his heart, for his sake, for your sake, Jesus, I will do this. We go, well, I'll do this because I'm a Christian for his sake. 
He goes, well, you're sort of missing the point here. There's no attachment to me. There's just a commitment like a soldier to a, you know, cause. <clears throat> but now the stinger of death is removed and has become an effective tool by the crucified Christ and those who adopt this pattern. Through him that loved us, this is uh, verse yeah, still more than conquerors. Verse 37, nay, and all these things, we are more than conquerors. But it says, it doesn't say you're more than a conqueror. It says you're more than a conqueror through him that loved us, meaning through this way of self-giving, this love of God, this nature. God is love, this way of self-giving. You're not automatically a Christian more than conqueror, just like you don't automatically suffer with Christ and reign with him because you're too busy being an heir of God and not being a joint participation per, participant with Christ in his sufferings. <clears throat> we can only be this, uh, this more than conquerors through him who first loved us. It has to be, we, we have to get it first from him. If it wasn't for oneness, we'd have nothing. We would. We'd be us. How do you like that? Does that sound good to anybody? Just be, be yourself. Just be yourself. All right. We, we can only be this through him who first loved us, dies for us, through him who dies for us. That's what it says in verse 37. In other words, what we go through in terms of suffering is not unique to us or our situation alone, but it is the continuance of Christ as exemplified by the cross. It's not unique to us. We misread much of our sufferings. I know there's a devil. I know there's things that we suffer. But I know that, that all things, I'm, I'm sorry to write this word on the board. All things work together for them. That's just a few verses up from this. But we can't, we can't, I can't embrace that. No, this is too wrong. This is the devil. How do I know this is the devil? It's too wrong. How do I know it's too wrong? It offends my righteousness. It makes me look bad when you're the bad person. So I can't, I can't tolerate this. Don't talk to me about the cross, being crucified with Christ. You need to die, buddy. You need to, you know. And all of our evil comes up that was never dealt with because we don't understand it at all. I don't care how many times we hear it. I don't care how many times it's been said. It's still... It's, it's not foreign to our theology, it's foreign to our nature, therefore it's foreign to us. Best thing to do is admit that. Jesus said, if you say you see, you're blind, but if you say I'm blind, I don't see. He goes, okay, I'll heal you. But we're too busy being spiritual. No, oh no, oh I got this. Oh yeah, I got this. Carolyn? Really? I can't imagine. Well, the problem is that he's, you, you know, even if we admit he's in control and he ordered this, he's still usually not in control of us. And, and, and here's why. But here's why. Because we don't recognize that it's not just him being in control. He has ordered this. And specifically, we can know, you know, somebody says, 
God works in mysterious ways. What is it? Something to perform, you know. Uh, his wonders to perform. Okay, they're so mysterious we can't know. Yes, you can. All things work together for good to conform you to the image of his son, the one who is in being Christ crucified, not just a title Christ and died. It's who he is by nature of God. And we can know that anything, everything doesn't work necessarily to, to make me more humble. I mean, we go, well, God just wanted to humble me. You know? Yeah. So you're the best humbled Adam I've ever had. You know, now would you just go to the cross and die? Amen. You know? But no, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to work on us. And, oh, let's see, what are you trying to get out of me out of this? Jesus, what's it going to take? Your death? You know, <laughs> that's the way he talks to me. <laughs> you know, it's, I, some of y'all would like to, you know, how you can listen to, to um, like on the plane sometimes we'll listen to music or watch a video and I've got a little thing that you can plug two headphones in and she's listening and I'm listening to it at the same time. Would you like to plug into me and hear God talk to me sometimes? That's the way he talks. And it doesn't offend me. I love it. I want it because I know my freaking mind and what it'll do. And I love him slamming into it and saying, I'm your father. And this is, you claim you want the son. And you claim that you're a son of God. So what do you think? And I go, I think yes. <laughs> it's been years and years and years since I said, well, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't roll that way anymore, <laughs> you know. I learn. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. Then I'll just let you go your way then, no problem. Yeah. And you're, wait, come back, <laughs> you know. Because after he's done that a few times, you're just going, this is bad. Right. You know, next time he's like, well, I'll just let you have your way then. You know, no, no, you know. <laughs> you're dragging him yeah. off, you know. Because you, you want the Lord and you want the Lord in a real way. And, when, and again, if what we've been sharing here, if this is true, that this is the original intention of God, what other calling is more important than this one? I'm not saying drop all the other calling. If God calls you to China, go to China. But go to China by carrying Christ, crucified in you, you know. Because guess what? When you get over there, that's what you're going to be dealing with. <laughs> you, know, you know, you say, I wish God had equipped me better. Or I wish you to listen better. <laughs> you know? Praise God. <clears throat> All right, so we can only go through, uh, go, we can only be this through him that loved us. Um, I'm just kind of rereading re again here. In other words, what we go through in terms of suffering is not unique to us or our situation alone, but it is the continuance of Christ as exemplified by the cross. If we're, if we're Christ-minded, let this mind be in you, Christ-minded, if we're Christ-minded and that is our mind, then everything is filtered through this, the world and our senses, everything is filtered through the cross or through Christ crucified. So you see things. You see things in the scriptures that others wouldn't see. You see things outwardly. You go, well, this is, this is, and you better believe that I do this, I have to do this all the time, and I'm sure I miss it a bunch, but I do, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for me to lay down my life. And most people go, are you crazy? This is horrible. Those people are, you know, attacking you for no reason or whatever. I go, this is, this is great. You say, well, who really does that? There's a few idiots left, and I'm one of them. I see it all the time. I mean, I see it so many times. I mean, and I just go, this, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity for you to get your son and for me to embrace the truth that I believe, that I preach, that I claim to live by, that Christ is my life and I no longer live. And I thank you for it. Now, am I perfect in every situation? I don't know. I'm not keeping score. I'm not. I'm, I'm, my, my attention is not on how good I'm doing 
and there's a scorecard. My attention is on the Holy Spirit keeping me. Hey, wake up, you know, come on, champ, go back out there, you know, <laughs> get out there. Go slow, boom, you got hit one more. And you go in, you go in with the mind of Christ and with the Spirit of the Lord instead of, whoa, this is wrong. Look at this. Why would you do this to me? Or, well, you know, and, you know, you know, I believe you're in control, but you're going to get a big freaking baby out of this with me. No, I don't like this. He would rather not send the sufferings your way to see that. Am I right or wrong? You're God. <laughs> He's God. He's going, go, oh, God. <laughs> He's got nowhere else to turn when he sees that. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. <laughs> it's bad stuff. <clears throat> Paul and others saw their sufferings as a participation both in the nature of the selfless one and in the cross of Christ. Therefore, it was a privilege to suffer. And I have in parenthesis faith because the faith, I'm, I didn't get the chance to get into it. We, you know, we're lucky to be where we are now, but in chapter three and four, and then the rest, this latter part, you're going to see faith a lot. And the faith, folks, the faith is this belief in Christ crucified, not the, not the, the event, but the, the spirit that brought him there. And this is the faith we're supposed to have. Anyway, someday, someday. <clears throat> so we see that oneness with Christ, whether in life or death, was accounted as a blessing as a blessed thing by the early believers. They had faith that life for others comes out of death. Didn't they? They did. Since Paul was dead with Christ at the cross, then the life he lived in the flesh was Christ's life of self-giving, Galatians 2.20. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God in the way that he proceeds, who loves and gives himself for others, for me, when I was messed up. And I live by that now, so I'm no longer a live. Christ lives within me. I don't know if you can see that, but that's the faith of the Son of God. We're looking for some sort of faith that is lesser than eternal faith. That's right. Amen. All right. So, blah, blah. So we, I'm not sure where we're at. It brought about life for others, which comes from Jesus' death, both originally, and that's 2,000 years ago, and within those who choose to live by this life. Therefore, suffering is not to be looked upon as an end, but as the very goal with the result that others are blessed. When God sees that spirit lived out, he eventually exalts it because he's going to exalt his son. He has exalted his son. He has. You say, what are all them people doing up around them? <laughs> his son is in them. He's, he exalts his son. I don't know how much we can grasp that. I don't know how much I grasp it. Okay. Lord, help me get through this. Are we getting close? <gasps> we are. Oh, thank you, Lord. All right. This one is called Redefining the Reason for Suffering. Redefining the Reason for Suffering. Redefining. In Romans 8, 31 through 39... Paul is redefining the reason for suffering. Most see suffering as the result of God's departure. Suffering is the result of God's departure. That's the way they see it. Or God's rejection of themselves. I'm suffering because God's punishing me. It's got to be why this, all these bad things are happening. God is upset with me and he's punishing me. But Paul sees them in several different ways. He not only sees God as with him, right? And that, that's what Romans 8 is talking about. God before us, who can be against us? I'm persuaded that neither height nor depth nor principality, power, things present, things to come, or any other creature shall separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Paul sees them in... Um, he sees, he not only sees God as with him in his sufferings, as if he were there abiding with him during the trial, 
but that for one to take on such suffering does so not only for Christ, but that his very nature is empowering them to give themselves in the same way as done by Christ crucified. God is not just with him. I know God's here. I know God hadn't left me. I know God is with me. Paul went well beyond that. He said, God is in me. He's not, he's not with me, with me. He's with me, in me. And the proof of that is that he is empowering me to go through these sufferings in a manner that will benefit others even if I get nothing out of it. That's the faith, folks, at work. It does not separate us from the love of Christ, but becomes an act of joining more into the love of Christ as demonstrated at the cross. To him, to Paul, to him, it is as if the trials are God's way of giving us opportunity to express that kind of love to others by means of self-abasement and self-sacrifice. The sufferings which are brought about strictly because one has set himself to live as a sheep for the slaughter for the benefit of others sees his sufferings as a joint participation with Christ and him crucified. You know? If children, then heirs, heirs of God. But also different color, less pain, and joint participants with Christ if we suffer with him in this manner it's not just going through any old suffering there's nothing there is no I'll probably deal with that next but there's just no virtue in just flat out suffering we're not talking about just flat out suffering we're not just talking about you you know your your horrible situation of a kid dying or this happening or whatever there are there are people all over the world that go through terrible trials that are just suffering and there's nothing virtue about it I don't promote suffering I promote being with Christ in his nature which may take on suffering for us but blessing for others and I think that Jesus recommended it when he went and died on the cross and then we're given the information here in Romans 8 that God spared not his own son but he sent him and, when, and then we looked at the scriptures that says, sending, when he sent his son, he sent him to the cross. He didn't just send him down here. Oh, just go to the earth. It'd be a good vacation for you. Go to the earth, you know. Or see some, see some different things. See some things differently when you're down there. No, go down there and die. Give yourself. He said, yeah. I don't condemn them for it. I'm, I gladly do this. We suffering as a joint participation with Christ and him crucified and not of God's rejection or withdrawal from us. In other words, suffering is not revealing the absence of God, but the presence of God in you as you bear about his dying in your mortal flesh. Things that actually bring opportunity to participate in the cross of Christ could never therefore separate us from the God of the cross of Christ, but only bring us closer. Those sufferings, if understood, could only bring us closer to this God, uh, the way he is, and we're with him. We say, I'm with you in this. It can only bring us closer. They're not our enemies, but we've made them our enemies because we believe only good things work together for good, and not ba bad, good, indifferent, doesn't matter. God will use it all to conform me to this son who is self-giving, you know? Things that actually bring opportunity, instead of thoughts being unloved, instead of thoughts, our thoughts being that of being unloved by him and experiencing separation from him, we have thoughts of unity of oneness in him and of being of the same kind as him. All right. One more subtitle with only two paragraphs. Establishing the truth in practical ways. Okay, so uh, Romans 8, 36. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. 
we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Romans 8.36 continues to address this theme of selfless giving done for others. For your sake, we are killed. For your sake, we are killed. Not just we just die because we're committed. I just don't, oh Lord, help, help me Jesus, help me Holy Spirit. Here's a perfect picture of cross suffering. They are going into death continually for others. <clears throat> All the day long, continually for others. It is a death done out of love and not forced upon them. <clears throat> okay, and then Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <clears throat> in Romans 8, 38 and 39, the apostle then puts this truth in the context of actual sufferings and affliction. Contrary to what some think, Paul does not rejoice in suffering in general, but only that carried out in the spirit of Christ, the sufferings of the Lamb. For this reason, Paul says, we boast in our sufferings. Remember that? Romans 5.3. See, he was building all the time. He's building a temple. He's building blocks into us that will make us a habitation of God so he can live through us in this manner. He's not just trying to make a religious edifice we can go to and rejoice in a God that's far away while we live and go do whatever we want to do in us. He's building. God is using Paul to build forward, and it's all there, and you see the pieces early. And then as you go further into the day, the light gets brighter and brighter, and you see this thing begin to take shape, and you, and you, you, you marvel at the at the ability of God now not as an artist but as a builder to put each stone just in the right place to put each place right in the right section and to let him build us into what God always intended In Philippians 1.29, we see that we have been blessed. Uh, let's, let's keep your place here, but let's go to Philippians 1.29. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Um, this, for unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe, but to suffer for his sake. In that context, let's see if I've got it written down here. In Philippians 1.29, we see that we have been blessed. It has been given. And the word given there is actually the word graced. We have been graced not only to believe but to suffer with him. And in the, and the perfect wording, the one you is, it is we've been graced in behalf of Christ. But see, we've been graced to do this on behalf of Christ now. It's not him doing it for us. You see that? And, and Paul is saying, this is an incredible grace that God has extended to us beyond believing. And it's now you living out this same spirit, but now towards Jesus, giving back for a change. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. For him. For his benefit, for his whatever, whatever, it doesn't matter. The point is, 
that he see he gets something out of it. Maybe he gets my death was worth something. Maybe it brought forth something more than just a bunch of babies who went their way. In Philippians 1.29, we see that we have been blessed or graced to suffer with him. Remember that Jesus, by the grace of God, suffered for us. That's where. Hebrews 2.14, we hit two, Hebrews 2.11, we hit Hebrews 2.15. I'm telling you, Hebrews 2 is on the same wavelength that this is. <clears throat> this, uh, by the grace of God, suffered for us. This is in opposition to what many Christians believe concerning grace. They don't believe that you were grace to suffer you know you know by by the grace of god jesus suffered for us they'd say that's not grace the grace of god is when he gets you out of suffering i need the grace of god to get me out of this jesus saw it in a completely different light he saw it in light of a mind that does not think it's worthy to be grasped after to be equal with god but humbled himself. We think grace has been given when we are taken from suffering, but that would be more the act of conquering our sufferings. But Jesus wasn't trying to conquer his sufferings. He was trying to utilize them for others. God did not conquer Jesus' sufferings at the cross, but allowed him to go through them but in a certain spirit, in a certain spirit. All right. So the, the goal, we got two more classes. We got one more meeting time next Thursday. And I want to just move, well, I want to move into Romans 9. But before, we, before I quit here, I'd like to read the first three verses in Romans 9 so that you can see that this was not just a message from the Apostle Paul, it's how he lived. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Same spirit, same spirit. Now, now he's made it personal. Now he's made it in a situation uh, and in a, um, a, a obvious situation that these Christians are coming into now. And you can believe it that some of the Jews that became Christians and really realized this is what it's all about, looked down on those who didn't. But even if they were wrong, and Paul goes on in 9 and 10 and shows they have a zeal for God, but not after knowledge. He doesn't, he doesn't deny what is wrong. He just wants to make sure that before he starts talking about that, his spirit is that he would lay down his, and not just lay down his, oh, I'll lay down my life. We say that. He said, I would be a curse from Christ. It's different. Father, we just ask your spirit to seal up what has been shared to not let this class have been in vain, this course. As we wrap it up next week, may your spirit be here to stir, to impart, to challenge, to convict, to enlighten to do all the things that we need. And Lord, may we not be afraid of being convicted or being appearing as a convict because we are wrong, but to allow the Holy Spirit's conviction to drive us more to Jesus without hesitation, with passion, eagerly to go to him lay hold of him.
So, Father, I thank you for your spirit who is faithful, who has done exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Continue to do that in us, Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.